The jury will not be sequestered. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. Getting the Weinstein case, fellow silence breakers, and any yeah, of the selection is moving along well, here. Well, I'll read the verdict, says the Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us. We don't tend to see it as raw as this. Good evening and welcome. Bob, did you kill Susan Burma? No. Do you know who did? No, I do not. Do you realize you have an absolute right not to testify? I am aware of that. Do you want to testify in your own behalf? Yes. All right, welcome back to Law and Crime Network. For the record, my name is Bob Bianchi. I'll be taking it at 3 o'clock. There you saw it. Robert Durst, who, in fact, is on the witness stand. But before we get to that, let's go to uh, the Terry uh, Stephen, Tennessee versus Stephen Wiggins case. There was a conviction. A 10 of the 12 counts was, in fact, convicted of capital murder for the shooting death of a police officer. He is on trial for his life right now. It was always about the death penalty in the case. That's where the win-loss fault is going to be for prosecutors and defense in this case. Will he get the death penalty or won't he? The defense arguing he's got brain damage and that he suffered extreme cruelty as a child and has mental illness in the attempt to spare Wiggins' life. We'll see what happens with that case. Uh, certainly a cold-blooded murder, that is for sure. But can the defense overcome the emotion of what they saw with regard to the body cam video of what this officer being shot and literally executed? We'll see. Uh, with respect to Robert Durst, they're getting ready to start court soon. Durst is on the witness stand for the third day in a lengthy direct examination. We haven't even gotten the prosecutor, Lewin, who we know is an aggressive beast as a trial lawyer in cross-examination. I anticipate the irresistible force meeting the immovable object there. Durst is going to want to tell his narrative. Lewin, the prosecutor, is going to try to stop him from doing that. And the judge is going to have a lot of work on his hands, I predict. But this gives us a great opportunity to go back to some of the most crystallized and important aspects of the testimony of Robert Durst so far while we wait for the jury to come back. And one of them was the week before the disappearance of Kathy Durst. Let's not forget, he is accused of killing Susan Berman because Berman, he, is the motive by the state, says that she was going to spill the beans in the investigation with regard to the murder or disappearance of Kathy Durst. So it's very relevant in this trial and certainly has come out a lot about what was going on in their relationship? Well, the week before and the night before, the last that Kathy Durst was seen alive was testified to by Robert Durst and a lot of acrimony going on in that marriage at that point in time on that last day. Let's take a listen. There, was there an argument over that? Over... Yes. Tell the jury about that argument. I said, give me the keys. Kathy hated the cold. She wore a big down tan coat that went from her ears to her ankles. The coat had two big pockets in the front where Kathy kept everything, her purse, compact cases, eyeliner, dollar bills, coins, keys. So when I said, give me the keys, she looked at the coat. And then we both made a headlong dive to grab the coat. Where was the coat? It was draped over the couch, back of, the back of the couch. All right. What happened Kathy then? Kathy got one arm. I got the other arm. We both pulled, and a bunch of stuff came out of the pockets, including the keys. So I picked up the keys and said, I'm going to go out and disable the car. What did you do next? I went outside and opened up the hood and unplugged one of the battery cables. Then I walked back inside. When I got back inside, Kathy was just getting out of the shower. Again, that's Robert Durst on direct examination, talking about the night before and the weekend before, or the week before, actually. With regard to this acrimony going on, we have Paul Townsend with us, criminal defense attorney. Paul, welcome to the show. And the defense attorney is getting this out in direct examination with Durst about a kind of 
violent encounter over the keys that were in a jacket and a struggle that was going over that jacket. Um, getting out ahead of the prosecutor, so as to kind of take the steam out of that coming on cross-examination, the jury saying, wait a minute, the defense never told us about it? Is that the theory as to why he's getting this information out in your mind? Most likely. That, that's a common thing that both prosecutors and defense attorneys will do on direct. The, the idea is that you want to show the jury that you're not hiding anything, that you're going to present the God's honest truth, the good, the bad, the ugly, what have you, and it prevents your opponent from bringing up negative things for the first time so that the jury isn't left with the impression that you're trying to sugarcoat things, that you're only you know, giving information that's helpful, that you're hiding things. Um, and it allows you to frame the narrative of the situation so that you can kind of set the tone for it and make it as positive for you as possible, despite it not necessarily being a great situation for you. It allows you to to get your message out about it rather than on cross where you're you're led by the attorney about the situation itself. Paul, what do you think about <clears throat> the manner in which Durst is testifying? I mean, number one, it strikes me that, <clears throat> excuse me, all the arguments that were being made with respect to him not being competent are not only accurate, he is very competent. In fact, yesterday he even instructed his, his lawyer at a break, you forgot to ask me a question. And the lawyer actually said that in front of the jury. You reminded me at the break. He's answering questions cogently in narrative form, that's for sure. Uh, but it seems as almost as if Durst is going to just give this narrative. He is not going to be dissuaded. He is not going to be interrupted. So what do you think about how he's doing so far? And what do you anticipate with re regard to Prosecutor Lewin, who has throughout this trial been very vocal in stopping narratives, uh, making them answer yes or no questions. I just don't think Durst is going to do it. What do you anticipate as a trial lawyer you do under those circumstances? A okay, couple questions there. Uh, first, I do think it's it's really interesting. If you go back just a week or so, when the defense put on Dr. Uh, Keith Klein to testify that Durst is is physically and mentally incapable of even making the decision about testifying on his own behalf and that anything that he says, I think Dr. Klein's exact phrasing was, can't even be relied upon. But as we see Durst testifying, he remembers details from specific situations from 40 years ago, or at least he's testifying about details from 40 years ago, in a way that are certainly indicative of him relaying a narrative as though he's replaying it from a day, a week ago, so it 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 almost you know is is counter cuz the the judge has heard that Durst is is incapable and and thankfully that wasn't in front of the jury but Durst it really is showing a a strong command of the facts and and his memories and so you know I think to that end it's going well for him and and on direct it should be I think with regard to Lewin we have seen him be for lack of a better term, a real bully on cross-examination. And, and one can only assume that when he gets his turn to go after Durst on the stand, that it is going to be a no-holds-barred fight. I don't think he's going to back down. I don't think Durst is going to back down. Yeah, I, I agree with you completely. The judge is going to have a lot of work to do in order to try to constrain both the prosecutor and defendant. Uh, but something that's interesting here is to remember that Durst fell within the trap. A lot of high-profile people do when they're trying to protect their public image, and that is talk when defense lawyers don't want them to do. And that includes the documentary, The Jinx, where he basically gives a contradictory story with regard to the night before, not mentioning anything with regard to this altercation. And another admission that's very interesting. Let's take a listen. We didn't have a fight. We didn't wrestle. We didn't touch her the night that, that uh, she disappeared. Because we had to go to the train. Yeah. But you did tell me uh, in our last conversation that that, that you did have a physical altercation that night? I don't think I had a physical altercation that night. You're sure I told you that? Because she came home, she was yelling and screaming. I don't remember pushing. I do remember going into the bedroom and locking the door and taking a pill. I don't remember any pushing and shoving, though. So we know that you're comfortable lying when it's appropriate? Yes. So an admission that he makes uh, during this uh, interview, Paul, is that he doesn't have a problem lying when appropriate. And the jury in this particular case has heard that. How damaging 
is that kind of information to the jury when they're actually witnessing the testimony of a person who says, you know, I'm admittedly, I'll lie. I, I think it, it can't be anything but extremely damaging to him. As you said, Durst has one major problem in this case, and it's that he has reams and reams and reams of transcripts of things that he has said over the past 20 to 40 years about the disappearance of his wife, uh, about Susan Berman. He has given interviews to Lewin and investigators. He has been on Netflix documentaries. He has spoken to the press. There is so much information out there that he has given, and a good portion of it is contradictory, and it's now even contradictory to the things that he's saying on the stand. You have to assume that Lewin, who is, if nothing else, extremely prepared for every witness that comes in, he is going to have bullet after bullet after bullet of, you said this, you said this, you said this. You know, those are all contradictory. Why should anybody on this jury believe what you're saying now, mm -hmm. especially when you've told them and you've made it very clear you're willing to lie on your own behalf? So he's right. he's going to have some trouble with all the things he said. OK, let's listen to a little bit of what he has to say about the night when he dropped Kathy, Dur uh, Kathy Durst off at the train station, uh, which is another interesting, pivotal piece for the prosecution's case. That was the last anybody saw. Let's take a listen. How are you doing? Are you tired? No, I'm not tired. So you get to the uh, Katona train station, and the parking lot um, doesn't have many cars in it. What do you, what do, you do next? So the parking lot is mostly empty. We were able to drive right up to the train station, where we could sit in the car and wait for the train to come. We were maybe 20 feet from the station. There were half a dozen other cars there with people waiting in them. Couldn't have been there more than five, I doubt it was even 10 minutes before the train came along. You could tell when the train was coming because everybody started getting out of their cars walking up onto the platform. So there must have been six, eight people on the platform. The train pulled in, the doors opened, everybody on the platform walked into the train. The train stayed 30 seconds, 45 seconds, pulled out and left. Was that the last that you saw of Kathy? That's the last time I saw Kathy. Did Kathy wear jewelry? She wore very little jewelry. She had some hippie kind of jewelry, some beads that she would frequently wear as a bracelet or as a necklace. But other than that, she wore very little jewelry. Did she have some diamond studs that she wore in her ears? Yes, yeah, she had some nice jewelry, but she hardly ever wore that unless we went to a fancy dinner. What about wedding ring? She had a wedding ring. She wore it sometimes. Do you recall whether she was wearing her diamond studs in her ears and her wedding ring when she left that evening? I have no idea. You don't know? Don't know. Did you actually see her get on the train? Well, everybody's asked me that question, and I've changed my mind probably a dozen times. She was standing on the platform with half a dozen people. The train pulled into the platform. The doors opened. The people got on the train, the doors closed, and the train left. Now, did I actually see Kathy walk through the doors onto the train? And the answer is, I don't know. But there is no, no place else to go. Once the train pulled out, was there anybody left? 
Well, one of the questions <clears throat> I want to ask you, uh, kind of picking up from the last one, is that the prosecutor has a decision to make here with regard to the manner in which they go about cross-examining a witness like this. And, and there's tactics involved in it. I've been somewhat critical of the prosecutor. I think he knows his case inside and out and is extremely thorough. But that you know, you're playing to an audience over there with a limited uh, time, you know, capacity. They've listened to this trial. They're probably tired. You could go on and on and on with cross-examining Durst, in my opinion, and that's what's going to happen. As opposed to being laser-focused in the most important areas that you want to show, and you can always leave the rest for summation, do you think Prosecutor Lewin is going to do that, or is he going to go back to that tendency to have to fight tooth and nail about every single little fact both large and small, exactly the same way with the same vociferousness? Well, I think if Lewin stays true to form, we're going to see option two. Uh, I, I agree with you that when you're cross-examining, the best, best move you can make is to be that laser focused, to get your points in, to make big hits and then move on rather than get bogged down in the weeds and the minutiae. But what we've seen with Lewin is that sometimes he just can't help himself. He gets on a roll. He feels that he needs to extract, you know, certain words, certain phrases. And rather than take his wins and move on, we have seen him kind of muddle his wins in, in the weeds and argue and bicker and try and force a certain phrase. And it really doesn't, I don't think, do him any, it doesn't score him any points with the jury. So I hope that yeah. he's focused. I have a feeling that we're going to see the other way. Well, listen, if you want to know what's going to happen in this case, I suggest you put every TV on in your house, every computer. We are on all platforms here at the Law and Crime Network because you don't want to miss it for a second. It is going to be a doozy. That's my prediction. We're going to take a quick break here at the Law and Crime Network. Please stay with us because we'll be right back. All right, welcome back. So we are just awaiting for this trial to resume with the third day of direct examination of uh, Mr. Durst. But while we have that opportunity, let's listen to a clip again from the jinx. The director, Andrew Jarecki, um, asking questions where the defendant, is, uh, Mr. Durst, is making an admission that he lied to police with regard to calling Kathy Durst after the time that he had dropped her off at the train station. Again, another like damning thing and contradiction in the case that just an unforced error getting in there and talking about this stuff that will be used possibly to put him in jail for the rest of his life. Let's take a listen. The court of missing is their problem. Mm -hmm. Put her on the train, she came to the city, I don't know where she is, she's not going to medical school. There's got to be something wrong. Now, it was going to become their problem to figure out yeah, what this was. Police course. look for missing persons. What am I supposed to do? I don't know that I ever filmed in all the little pieces of all that, but I just wanted to get it done with it. I'm going to record it, and that'll be that. I, I did not go through my mind that police ask oodles of questions and go here and there and everywhere. just wasn't used to that. I was never I was not used to somebody questioning my motive, mm -hmm. questioning my veracity. Um, <clears throat> so after you uh, uh, went back home the night that she went missing on Sunday night, there was some discussion about you think you spoke to her at some point, somebody called somebody, what was yes, that? Yes, yes, that was the last part of my, you know, the police are going to leave you alone now. I said, I, I said, I called her. And I said, I stopped at a pay phone on the way home. Or I went out for a walk later, and I, and I called her from the pay phone. She answered the, the, the phone, and that puts her in the city. And uh, they're going to leave me alone now. They'll just accept this, and they'll go look for her. If, she, if she's you know, really missing, if you know, they'll, they'll look for her, and I'll have done the right thing. Did the, um, uh, the process of, let's say you were sitting in the precinct, you're talking to Mike Strzok, 
and you know that you're telling them something that's a lie, did you, was there a speed bump in there? Did you think to yourself, I thought I was going to tell them this. They were going to see that Kathy got to the city. They were going to go look for Kathy. Kathy did get to the city. She didn't jump off the train. But in the okay, course of... Okay, mention of lying. We're going to have to cut that clip a little short because they are alive in trial. And like we like to say, if they're alive, we're alive. So let's go to it. Yeah, the freedom of the Senate would accomplish nothing. The police would do nothing. Did you disagree with that? Well, I decided to go to the police. I don't know if I disagreed or not. You had mentioned uh, uh, that the lady that the precinct that you talked to yes, the day before, on Thursday, uh, took a rather light attitude about it? The lady said, well, what I said, I can repeat it. I should repeat it. Well, I, I think the jury probably remembers that, but uh, did you take offense at that? No, I didn't know her. She was a voice on the telephone. She was doing her job. I assumed she would have acted that way no matter who called. Okay. So, Friday, though, you have, when did you make the determination that you were going to go in person to the police? Well, I made a determination Thursday evening when I called the police and the lady said, if you want to report a missing person, you got to speak to the immediate family and you got to report it in person. All right. We've already gone over that you called um, Jimmy McCormick that evening, right? You have to verbalize your answer. I'm not sure what the question is. You, you, you've already testified that you talked to, or you called Jimmy McCormick, Kathy's brother, yeah. that evening. Is that? Who was living with his mother. So I felt that was the immediate family. Okay. So, um, just to clarify, where did you spend the night Thursday night? South Salem. When did you pick up your dog from the vet? Thursday morning. All right. And so, where did you go, or where did you go before you went to the office on Friday to speak with your uh, father and others? I went to 12 East 86th Street. I was thinking maybe Kathy was hiding in plain view, plain sight. So I went to the apartment, 1520, and it was very apparent, A, that Kathy was not there, but also that nobody had been there for a long time. There were clothes strewn about. It was heavily dusted. There were dishes in the sink that looked like they'd been there for weeks. All right, let me clarify. Are you talking now about East 86th Street, not Riverside Drive? Yeah. Okay, so you went to, went to East 86th Street also? I went to 12 East 86th Street, and then I went to the office. Okay. Where was, where was the dog? At Riverside Drive. After your meeting with your father, what did you next do? In the middle of, <clears throat> in the, middle of the afternoon, I went to Riverside Drive. What did you do there? I listened to the messages, hoping there would be something from Kathy which there was not. And what did you do next? Well, I got this idea that I was afraid that the police would, would make an effort to do nothing. So two years before then, a 
about New York Magazine had a cover article titled, Who Owns New York? And they had the photographs of five guys on the cover. One was Donald Trump in his 30s, and the other four guys included Seymour Durst and three other real estate honchos. Already in evidence, uh, I'm not sure what the uh, people's uh, exhibit number is. It's on our, on our short list, it's number five. If we could put that up. 18. I'm sorry? People's 18. 18? Thank you very much. Uh, on the screen now is uh, the, the, that front page of New York Magazine. It's dated May the 19th, 1980. Is that the magazine you were referring to? Yes. And which one is Seymour? He's in the bottom. <coughs> He's in the bottom right-hand corner. Okay. And that's our... F <coughs> <coughs> and that's our former president in his 30s in the upper left-hand corner. So you, you went to Riverside Drive, you got that magazine. Why did you get that magazine? Well, I thought this would impress the police that this is a serious thing and they should take it seriously. I was still hoping that my dad had been wrong and I would not need to do anything that they would just accept the, the fact that Kathy had now been unseen for five days and proceed to do what the police do when a person is missing. I'm not sure I understand your answer. Would you explain a little bit about what your thinking was about this magazine and taking it with you to the police station? I was hoping I wouldn't have to show it to anybody. I was hoping that the police would accept me reporting that Kathy Durst, um, um, who's in her fourth year of medical school, is not going to medical school, has not come home, and has not contacted her immediate family. So by this time, were you worried? Yes, I was getting worried. You mentioned that earlier in the week you were more upset uh, than you were worried. All right, we're going to take a little break here in the Low Crime Network. We'll be right back. Robert Durst on the stand, the direct examination during the break, talking about him reporting a missing persons report with the police. Let's go back live report. Cubicles, office right. cubicles. Good word for it. Thank you. Yeah, they all had cubicles. All right. So did you go to this detective? I did. What happened then? I started to explain to him about taking my wife to the train station in Katona Sunday night and how I hadn't heard from her as of then and that her medical school had telephoned several times to say she was not attending class. And what did that detective do? That detective said, well, I've got something else I have to do in half an hour, so let me bring you to somebody else. And he took me to Mike Strook. And where was Mike Strook? His cubicle was four or five cubicles away from the first detective. So 
did the first detective seem interested or not interested in what, what you had to report? He seemed glad to give me to Mike Stroke. Okay. And uh, so tell us how you approached Mike Struck or he uh, approached you. To tell us about that. I told him what I told the first detective. I was worried about my wife because she had not made an appearance since Sunday night and she was in medical school and she said something must have gone wrong because she wouldn't go hiding someplace. Did you have the um, magazine with you? I had the magazine with me and at some point I brought up that my wife was in this program at Lenox Hill Hospital and was supposed to help her get off of cocaine. That sparked his interest. All right. Which was it that sparked his interest? The fact that she was in a cocaine rehab program or that uh, you had the magazine or wh whatever? I hadn't shown him the magazine yet. Okay. When I told him that, that she was in the cocaine program, this drug rehab program at Lennox Hill, he seemed to get much more interested in what I was saying. Okay. What kind of questions did he ask you? Well, he wanted to know how my marriage was. I told him we had our ups and downs, but it was kind of a medium. Um, he, he wanted to get the names and phone numbers for Kathy's immediate family members and any very close friends. Did you give him those? Yes, I gave him Jimmy McCormick's mother, Jimmy McCormick, the sister that was closest in age to Kathy, Mary Hughes, and I gave him Gilbert and Ajami, name and number, and another friend of Kathy's by the name of Bill O'Brien. Who was Bill O'Brien? He was a classmate at Albert Einstein. Uh, were you acquainted with Bill O'Brien? Yes, he'd been at our house several times in South Salem. Uh, any other names that you gave Detective Struck? That's what I gave him. I, I had my contacts with me. All right. What else uh, happened there with they, with uh, Detective Struck? Well, then he said he brought me to kind of a bullpen where there was a TV and several detectives. I assume they were detectives watching TV. And he said, sit here for a little while and I'll make telephone the people you gave me the names of. Did you do that? Yes, for about an hour. Had you shown him the magazine yet? No. All right. So you sat uh, in a bullpen with a TV and some other detectives, and uh, while he made calls, did you see or hear him make those calls? No. He was in the... Um, cubicle that was 30 feet, 30, 40 feet away. Okay. And you said, uh, you said it was about an hour. What uh, happened after that hour? He came out and got me and brought me back to his cubicle and told me he heard the marriage was not a medium, but it was a disaster. We had lawyers. I explained we had lawyers for a year and a half. And we had still spent most of our time together. Did you uh, tell him whether or not either you or Kathy had actually filed for divorce? I emphasized that we had had lawyers all this time, and neither of us had filed for divorce. Do you know what a restraining order is uh, that uh, either a husband or a wife 
can get against the other? Nothing like that. Did, uh, that was my next question. You know what it is, though. Say that again. Do you know what a restraining order is? Yeah. Did you, either one of you ask for a restraining order? No. And did you tell him that? It didn't come up. Okay. So what else? Well, first, when he uh, came back to you and said, well, you're, I'm hearing from your wife's friends that it wasn't medium, it was a disaster. What did you say? I said it might be a disaster, but we're together. We're together. All right, Paul, so uh, getting into uh, the marital issues, he actually corrects the lawyer here and there, which maybe the jury will find a little bit of credibility with. He seems to be very particular about his memory. How do you think he's doing on the stand so far? I think he's doing about as well as he can be. He has uh, what appears to be a pretty good grasp of a lot of intricate details, and jurors love to hear details, so that when he talks about, you know, the cubicle was 30, 40 feet away from where I was sitting in the bullpen, or the first detective shuffled me down four or five cubicles to the second detective, those are things that the jury is going to pick up on to say, okay, this guy really actually remembers what's going on, and he's giving us, you know, an honest account of this uh, this situation. So I think he's he's doing what he needs to do in terms of recounting this particular situation. Now, obviously, nothing about this, you know, has anything to do with whether or not he actually killed Kathy or Susan Berman, but I think the defense attorney is presenting him as a credible witness. Okay, Paul Townsend, thank you very much for that opinion. Looking forward to having more of it. We're going to take a quick break here on the Law and Crime Network. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. All right, there's talking a lot about the questioning of the police with the disappearance of Kathy there's at one point in time uh, the attorney stops him and says are you too tired to go forward there's a long pause and he says well yeah I'm tired I get up really early uh, in the morning in order to get to court but the testimony is continuing so let's go back live to court pretty much the top of Westchester County okay that's going from Manhattan toward Katona what about from Katona to Manhattan or Grand Central Station does it stop anywhere? Yes, between Katona and Grand Central Station are five stops. Uh, Detective Strook seemed to be familiar with the fact that there were stops between Katona and Grand Central Station. And he said, well, let's just assume she got on the train. Is it possible she got off at one of those stops before Grand Central Station? Well, how did you answer that? I said, yes, it's possible, but there's no reason she would. There was nothing, there was no reason that I could imagine why Kathy would take the train from Katona and get off at any of those stops, stations, before Grand Central Station. And he wanted to know if it was possible that she got off at one of those stops. And I was back at the same place with, yes, it's possible, but I cannot imagine why she would do so. Explain uh, if she, you or she went from Katona to Grand Central Station with the idea of winding up at Riverside Drive, how would you get from Grand Central Station to the Riverside Drive apartment? Take a taxi. Is it, how uh, far is it? Sunday night, there'd be little traffic, and it would take five, ten minutes, that's all. Okay. <clears throat> So take us there from the conversation you're having with Detective Strzok. What else did he ask you about? He said, so let's assume she got to Grand Central Station. Do you know if she got to Riverside Drive? And I told him about how 
on Monday morning when I come in, into the city, on the kitchen table, there had been a bottle of Coca-Cola and an ashtray with a cigarette butt in it. And that had not been there when we left Friday night to go to South Salem. So I, that told me that Kathy had to have gotten there Sunday night and left out the Coca-Cola when she left Monday morning. Okay. Um, so you told him that. What, what did he ask you? Uh, had you showed him the magazine yet? I still had not shown him the magazine. All right. Did he ask you anything about your family or what you did or uh, did he seem to know you or know who well, you would? Well, when I first met with him, I gave him sort of my vital information, my name and address and phone number. I said I worked for a family real estate business. Okay. Did that? Uh, did, did you see whether that made any kind of impression or not? Well, he he was not familiar with my family's company. All right. So now we're at the point where you've told him about um, finding the Coca-Cola bottle and the the cigarette butt in an ashtray in the kitchen that was not there uh, when you left on Friday. Uh, what's what next happened? Well, then he said, is it possible that when you left on Friday, a bottle of Coca-Cola and the cigarette and the ashtray were there? And I found myself at that point saying it's possible, but it's not what I remember. And at that point I said, this is important. My family is a big deal, and I showed him the magazine. Why did you do that? What was, what was your point in doing that? Well, I was getting the feeling that he was going to say, well, it's possible, you, you're not sure, your wife got on the train, you don't even know that you saw her get on the train. She could have gotten off at any of those stops before Grand Central Station. So you don't know that she got to Grand Central Station. You could have left out the bottle of Coca-Cola when you left. There's no evidence that anything is wrong here. She probably just took off for a while with friends. I was expecting to get a speech like that. And that's why I gave him the magazine. Did you? Uh, your state of mind, did you feel that he was taking it seriously or not? No, I was ready for him to tell me that I should go talk to somebody else. All right. And so what was your point in giving him or showing him the copy of the magazine? I was hoping he would see that this was important, that my family was important, enough so that if he did nothing, I would be able to get somebody, his boss or however that works, to insist that they go ahead and do what the police are supposed to do when there's a missing person. And what was that? To look for them. To look for her. Is that right? Yeah. Did you know how to look for Kathy? I had not the faintest idea, other than talking to her friends and family. I had not the slightest idea what to do. Well, you'd already talked to um, Jimmy McCormick, right? Right. And did he know where Kathy was? No. All right. So. Or if he knew, he didn't tell me. Of course, you know. All right, so that, here we uh, have Robert Durst, Kathy. who is giving examination uh, with regard to the reasons why he lied in some instances. And this is not an unusual thing necessarily at a trial. 
The question only becomes whether the jury is going to say that those were innocent uh, lies or whether they were deceptive lies with regard to trying to cover up the disappearance and murder of Kathy Durst. We'll have to wait to see what the jury says about that. We'd be interested to know what you know or what you think, but we'll be right back after this break.